All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 30th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. And this is the second video. I said I would do one on Calvinism. Why I hate Calvinism, the system. Yes, um, not that I, I don't know why I bother, really, because Calvinists are a tiny splinter of a tiny splinter in the Christian uh, universe. So. But... I guess because uh, I got sucked into it for a little bit, uh, partly because of the chaos that was going on in 2015, I think, and the fact that I didn't have anything else to do in the bookstore. I started listening to R.C. Sproul, who, is, who was a, uh, a soft-edged Calvinist. He, he tried to uh, bring things together and reconcile things that really can't be reconciled. So I want to look at... Uh, talk to you about the, the, the core of Calvinism. What makes Calvinism it's, uh, what it is? Um, and that is the eternal decree of God. Other Christians have avoided this. Luther sort of held to it, but uh, what Lutherans do with some of these questions, if God determines all things— then, and God loves everyone. God wants all people to be saved. Why aren't all people saved? And the Lutheran answer is, we don't know, <laughs> which is a good answer. Calvin's answer was, let me try to explain it to you, which was a foolish answer. So we're going to look at uh, probably the most authoritative and concise uh, confession of Calvinism in the world, and that's the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Second London Baptist Confession of 1689 is simply a ripoff of this. Uh, it was a slightly baptized version of it, but it's essentially the same thing. So, and there's also a uh, congregational version too out there that nobody bothers to look at. So, we're going to take a look at here. Uh, James White um, of YouTube fame. Um, is probably the most militant and vocal Calvinist out there. He's a Reformed Baptist um, of sorts currently. I, I'm. He regularly does a program on his channel called um, Radio Free Geneva, where he defends all things Calvinist, at least Baptist Calvinist. Every once in a while, though, he lets a little bit lets it slip a little bit. Though, maybe one of these days he'll repent of it, he'll realize that you cannot consistently hold to that. Uh, the, the, there's false advertising in the Reformation in general. The idea of sola scriptura—they're not sola scriptura. If you hold to a confession like the Westminster Confession of Faith, that's your authority. If you hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession as representing your faith, that's your authority. It's not the Bible. The sola scriptura, I found that out. When they say sola scriptura, they don't really mean it, which is why I was tagged with the position. My position is, according to some people out there, scriptura nuda. And I'll, I'll go with that. Bible unwrapped. Naked Bible, unwrapped by man's opinions and doctrines. Absolutely. I'll go with Scriptura Noda. Because Sola Scriptura apparently doesn't mean what they say it means, because all these confessions, they'll say, we hold to Scripture alone, except when we don't hold to Scripture alone, because our opinions are authoritative. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith was... Uh, created at the order of Parliament during the period of the English Civil Wars in the 17th century. 
and it was to be a mandatory state church religion statement of faith to replace the 39 articles uh, for Scotland and England. So uh, it didn't stay in place very long because Parliament, who had ordered this produced, uh, did not stay in power very long. They were utterly unable to govern. Uh, a warning to all you theonomists out there, you will be utterly unable to govern. And, uh, well, you'll be in a bad situation when you get tossed out on your be uh, behind, as, the, uh, as the, the parliament was, too. They had to call back the son of the king. See, they had executed King Charles, beheaded him. And then they, they were a failure. They could not govern. They were sort of like the, uh, the Congress in the United States today. So they uh, ended up having to call back the son of the king from being in uh, exile. And, of course, he came back with a bit of an attitude since they'd executed his father. They were, they were that desperate to restore the son of Charles to the throne. <laughs> that badly governing that they were willing to do something that extreme. So the Westminster Confession of Faith, the uh, it has a lot of things wrong with it. Again, this is mandatory. So if they had been able to keep this in place, you would have had to believe this on pain of prosecution of one form or another. And Puritans, which most of the people responsible for this were, there were some independents too, are not a tolerant people, as we know from the experience of the Puritans in New England. The king finally took their charter away because they were executing people outside of his jurisdiction. As in Rome, apparently only the king of England has the authority to have people put to death. Well, the uh, Puritans just thought, well, it's the will of God, so off with their heads. Well, they didn't do it that way. Let's see. The witch trials, the Salem madness, the, the witch trials thing. It was a relatively localized, crazy situation, but the Puritans, they did not tolerate dissent. They did not tolerate dissent at all. Uh, they cannot, the, the, just th imagine this. So the Puritans, we're talking about Calvinists. We're talking about high Calvinists. Uh, the, the people that would hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith that would write this thing. <clears throat> they were willing, because of their intolerance, they could not live in a sinful country like England. They could not tolerate anything but their idea of what was right in the sight of God, their particular idea. So they were willing to risk their lives and their families to travel and set up a colony in the wilderness in the New World, which was dangerous, and everybody knew it was very dangerous. You might not even survive the voyage because they were unable to live with their neighbors because they couldn't tolerate their neighbors not being as pure as them. See, they could only, they could not tolerate, they, they were, they were like the Old Testament. God in the Old Testament, you couldn't get too close to him because he had not yet reconciled the world to himself through the cross. And Puritans are very much Old Testament. So it's it's the God of wrath, the, the God that they're— because uh, God had not yet dealt with humanity's sin in a way that he could interact with uh, humanity— out of grace, you had people like, you know, when they, when the people that God brought out of Israel, when they disobeyed, when they, they desired other things, they, what happened? They died. They died. And so the holy God, which they always want to talk about, holy, 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 the holiness of God, 
But God dealt with the problem of man's sinfulness, reconciling the world to himself on the cross. So God could deal with us freely because Christ died for the sins of the entire world. He could deal with us uh, outside of his holiness and outside of his law, outside of his justice, because he paid the penalty for sin on the cross for the entire world. But Calvinists deny that Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. But it was necessary for God to treat us in any form other than rebels, deserving of death. How could he show mercy and still be just? Christ had to, had to die for the sins of the entire world. They reject that. They reject universal atonement. They're the only Christians that do, for all practical purposes. There are some others that claim not to be Calvinists, but they are Calvinists, like some of the primitive Baptists. They also reject um, universal atonement. So they have this pro logical problem with it. That's because they don't understand it. But, uh, yes, uh, so the, the core, the, the thing that makes Calvinism particularly evil and I'm going to say the God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible. It is a different deity. It's actually Satan. It's, it's satanic because it blasphemes God, the true God. So if you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, or this would be the same as the, the London Baptist Confession, and you look under chapter 3, that this is the real core of Calvinism, uh, the wrong window. The real core of Calvinism is God's eternal decree. That, and we'll see what that is right here. And I'm sorry if you can't read the text. I have no convenient way to blow this up here on the screen. So you'll just have to do it. If you're, on, if you're using a phone, you'll have to do the pinch and slide thing. <clears throat> Chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own uh, will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. In other words, he decrees, ordains, and ordains uh, unchangeably. <clears throat> this is determinism whatsoever, that's in all things in exhaustive detail. As John Piper would say, if there's one loose electron in the universe, uh, there is no God. <laughs> See, Calvinism has this very childish idea that God's sovereignty means that God has to control all things absolutely, that God, there can't be any will in the universe other than God's will. It is exceedingly childish, and it goes. But I, I'm without going into the the reasons why they have that. I'll just say it goes back to Aristotle because that's what it does. Through Augustine, it goes back to Aristotle. Aristotle's ideas of God, which he didn't know. The the perfection of God. It has to do with his uh, Aristotle's reasoning about a hypothetical deity that he didn't know that had to be perfect in all ways. And it goes to Plato, too. It's, but it's, we don't need to get into that right now. That's a long story. It took me a long time to, to figure this out and realize where it was coming from. I said, oh, that's why. But that's where, it, that's where its roots are. It's in pagan philosophy. Uh, and it's still there. It's very strong. Um, it's in sometimes called classical classical theism, but it's also called classical Christian theism, but it's not Christian at all. It's paganism. So he did ordain and decree unchangeably whatsoever comes to pass, exhaustively. Does not, not framing things and saying like a, a sandbox, that he decreed the sandbox and then put creatures with, with uh, some freedom in the sandbox. So in other words, not bounded liberty, but no liberty at all. There is nothing that God doesn't determine, has not determined from before creation in a single 
decree of all things, exhaustively, unchangeably. So God has decreed everything, including himself. See, he's not free to act anymore because he determined all things. It's, he's, God's a one-shot wonder. He, 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 he pulled the trigger, there was the big bang, and that's it. So he can't do anything. And, and to get into the details, he can't, God can't create, actually. The God of, uh, that they describe can't do anything. But we're just looking at the inter- eternal decree because that's where it's, it's evident. The problem with Calvinism is so evident here. So if God decreed everything, then he decreed all evil, too, every evil sin. And in a debate, James White, who is a high Calvinist, a Baptist high Calvinist, but he's a high Calvinist. So in other words, he holds to this very strongly. Uh, in a debate, he was questioned, so you're saying about the eternal decree, so you're, you're, you're saying that God decreed the rape of a child. In other words, that was the will of God. And James White answered, yes, and that gives it meaning. Uh, okay, but see, that's I'm not, I'm not distorting the view of Calvinists, consistent Calvinists. A lot of Calvinists try to soften that and try to get around it because of the obvious implication that if God decreed all things, then God decreed all evil, exhaustively, in all details. How can that God be good? He can't. He can't. That's not the God of the Bible. That is not the God of the Bible. And there's other reasons why they believe this, too, and I don't want to get into it. It has to do with the, the foreknowledge of God, but I don't want to get too far into the weeds here. <sighs> Whatsoever comes to pass... Whatsoever comes to pass, all things. So what does that mean? Murders are decreed by God. Evil is decreed by God. All the most debased, the genocide that's going on in Gaza right now is the decree of God, the unchangeable decree of God. It doesn't originate from man. It originates from God's decree. All things, including salvation, is by the decree of God. But the, the, the obvious implications of this being so horrendous, Calvin himself called this the awful decree. The decree that, that man would sin, in fact. The decree, God decreed the fall of Adam and everything else. Why didn't he just change his theology? It would have been easier. So immediately, because of the, uh, the implications of this, immediately they have to put a clause here to try to convince you that what they're saying doesn't necessarily imply that God himself is evil. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin. So if God decreed sin, God is not the author of sin, apparently. Nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures. Yeah, but they can't do anything other than what they've been decreed to do. Nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Yeah, it gives it meaning. No, that, that is just a caveat to try to avoid what they just said. Either God decreed, if God decreed all things exhaustively, then this clause here is nonsense. Nonsense. But they have to say that. Because otherwise, they would be self-condemned for who they really are, Satan. I mean, this is what Satan says. Satan is a slanderer of God. So God decreed all evil. That's slander. They say, well, yeah, but yeah, but uh, uh, he did it in such a way that he's not really the author, even though he is really the author, and he doesn't really offer violence to the will of creatures, but Yes, he does. Uh, and nor is liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. But no, it's not. It's just, it just, uh, it's just doublespeak. What they said was God decrees all things whatsoever, unchangeably. Which means he can't do anything 
other than that himself. So God has decreed himself to. You can't avoid the logic of it. You made the statement, you cannot weasel out of it. It gets worse. So uh, in two, now, what do they use for Scripture to prove this? The Parliament said, you've got to have scriptural proof. So they use Ephesians 1.11. I'll just, it, does, it won't show on your screen right now, but it's on mine. A pop up here. Uh, also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things there for the counsel of his will. Well, what is that? Predestined according to what? To what? To be conformed to the image of Christ. His people to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the, we are all predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, those who trust in Christ who works all things after the counsel of his will. What does that say? Everything God does, he does, is according to the counsel of his will. That's what it's saying. Uh, you, don't have, you, don't, you cannot derive from that text what they say, that God has decreed all things unchangeably. It, it just doesn't come from that. See, their doctrine does not come out of Scripture. It comes out of pagan philosophy. Again, Aristotle uh, and his classical theism. So that another verse they use is Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. So you're saying your doctrine of the eternal decree really is not, doesn't make any sense. So you're going to obscure it behind the fact that God isn't totally comprehensible by us. Well, where did you get the information from of your eternal decree? Uh, the Scripture's not teaching it here. So these Scripture, if the Scripture taught that, they certainly would have given us Scripture references that clearly teach an eternal, unchangeable decree of all things whatsoever. But it's not in the Bible. That's why they can't find a Scripture to support it that proves it. Hebrews 6, 17, in the same way God, desiring even more to show the, to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. Well, that's about the promises that are ours in Christ, those who believe in Christ. It says nothing about what they say, it says. This just shows that the authors of the Westminster Confession of Faith did not know how to handle the scriptures carefully, although the Parliament ordered them to give scriptural references. And if you've written a confession that is not based in the scripture, then you have to resort to what's called eisegesis. Read your doctrines into the scripture, even though the scripture doesn't teach them. That's what happens. Of course, they were Calvinists. That's you Calvinists read the Bible through Calvinist glasses. It blinds you to what the Scripture teaches, as all theology does. It blinds you to the Bible. It doesn't help. Any theology that is not rooted only in Scripture is bad. And even then, it's your human interpretation enters in. Even translations. A human inter uh, interpretation enters into the translation process. It's unavoidable. It's, it's more of a problem of in like paraphrases, a formal translation, less so, because they're bound by the rules of language. But they still have to make choices as far as words, what word you translate it by. So and people wonder, why do, we, why do you keep looking at the Greek? Because I want to know what Jesus said. And I'm aware of the problems of translation. That's why. I want to understand what he said. And English sometimes does not represent the, the possible range of understandings. So they also give us uh, Romans 9.15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Well, Romans 9 is one of their favorite texts they have for Calvinism. But when you look at the overall context that's putting in, that put in, what's Paul's argument there? All from, from Romans 1 to Romans 11, Paul's talking about one thing. His major overriding, overarching theme is we're saved 
by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Salvation, God has decreed that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, not of works. That's his theme. Like in Galatians, that's his theme. All through the Pauline epistles, that's his theme. We're saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ, not of works. How many times does he state that? Well, they take that, they've got this Calvinist thing, and they try to cram their theology into the Scriptures, and it's not there. They just simply don't read it in context. Their glasses, their Calvinist glasses, blind them, so they open the Bible and they see Calvinism, because that's the kind of filters they're wearing. They believe Calvinism, and therefore they see it in the Scriptures. Just like Roman Catholics see Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, in the Scriptures, even though that Scriptures aren't teaching it in context there. Like in uh, uh, some place like John chapter 6, I think it is, when Jesus says, I am the, the bread of life. They see the Mass. That's what they see. John th uh, chapter 3, when J Jesus says, you must be born of the water and the Spirit, they see water baptism, even though that's not what the context I indicates. And, and Nicodemus would have not have gotten that idea. And Jesus explains it in the next verse. They don't see it because they, they can't. They've got their Roman Catholic glasses on. So they see their existing doctrine, their existing beliefs in the Bible because their brain, well, our brains are built this way, people. Uh, it's not sinful. Our brains are neural networks, and neural networks are pattern-matching things, structures. Uh, very useful. So it's like when, when you look at the clouds, do you sometimes see things in the clouds that you know aren't really there, but you your, your brain is saying, this looks like a dog, or this looks like George Washington. Or if you're on the Mexican border and you look at a tortilla with uh, scorch marks on it, you know, the brown, oh, that looks like the Virgin Mary. <laughs> or that looks like Jesus. So they have a predefined image in their mind of what Mary looks like. Um. I don't know how you get Mary out of some of the things. Or people will see images like in the staining on a um, uh, an insulated window, you know, the, constant, the staining between the, the glass that appears. And they see a face there and say, oh, it's a miracle. It's an image of Christ. Down the valley, every, every month or two, there would be a, a news broadcast. The, the television crews would be out there. People would be out in the front yard of a little house burning candles because there would be a—, a a water stain on the window or a tortilla that got scorched and somehow it resembles to somebody the the Virgin Mary. And when you say that, other everybody else sees it too. Why? Because your brain does, is designed to try to recognize patterns, uh, patterns that are established by pre, uh, pre-existing beliefs and images. So you look at the clouds and you see something or, or uh, random patterns like in a ceiling tile or a stuccoed wall or something like that, and your brain is trying to make sense out of the confusion by uh, looking for something that's familiar, so to speak. So your brain is firing when it sees a pattern that, that's similar to something that's imprinted on it. So it's not really sinful. It's just part of what we are as human beings is and having a physical brain that's made up of neural networks. So when you believe Calvinism or you believe Roman Catholicism or you believe whatever, that is the pre-existing patterning that your, your, your brain is trying to match things to to make them understandable. Without that, we could not understand the world. We'd be overwhelmed by a constant strangeness. Be like a person with advanced Alzheimer's. It's just like, where am I? Every day they wake up in a strange place. 
terrible. Sometimes wake up screaming, where am I? Where am I? Same place you were yesterday, but they don't remember that. An awful situation to be in. But that's, that is, uh, you know, the physical, re physical reality of what happens somewhat. So it's not, it's not simply that they are trying to see their pre-existing beliefs, but it's a product of our physical brain. That's the way it'll naturally go. So, but we are not limited to that. We can go beyond that. We can we have we can reason. We are rational. Um, and if you know God, if you don't know God, well, you're out. You're out of luck there. But if the Spirit of God is in you and you're looking to Him for understanding, He will He will open your minds to understand. So that lock your mind is locked up in this these programmed neural networks. He'll give you knowledge beyond that. He'll open, give you understanding. So we, we have to understand by faith, not simply logically or rationally either, based on what we know. So here, so none of those uh, uh, so-called proof texts there, you know, so he has mercy on whom he desires, yes, and hardens whom he desires. Well, that's referring back to to uh, Pharaoh. Now, if you remember the story, it was a, a number, like three or four times that God did miracles through Moses and then says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And after so many examples of that, then it says, and God hardened his heart. So Pharaoh was exposed over and over again to evidence, God-given miracles, and he hardened his own heart, but eventually God said, enough of this. Uh, and God determined, because God had already determined that he was going to set his free people free and glorify himself through Pharaoh, Pharaoh's hardness of heart. So God said, okay. What that really means, too, is literally he strengthened his heart. So he just strengthened what Pharaoh already wanted to do. And Pharaoh was reaching the point where he was afraid and God just give, gave him the courage to do what he wanted. He did not cause Pharaoh to wish to do what he did. He just strengthened him in his desire. So that is not the same thing as decreeing that he sent. It was just, okay, this is the way you want to go? Go ahead. You ever had to do that with your children? Sometimes you do. Sometimes... You just have to let them, okay, you want to learn the hard way? Go ahead. They'll find out. But Calvinism does, is not, does not look to justify God's actions. They just go with their theology, which uh, blasphemes God. God is not the author of evil. In, in him there is no shifting or shadow. God is light, and in, in them is, there is nothing wicked. There is no sin in God. There is no darkness in God as they actually claim here uh, in, in their second clause, trying to justify themselves. Or for example, here, uh, John, John 1, um, 1 John 1, 5, and this is the message that we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So they throw that up there with their second clause that, that they try to use to cover up their first statement. Well, just get rid of that first statement. See, they have these pre-programmed uh, pre ideas about the way God is from Augustine. Most of these people wouldn't have gone back to, well, they probably would have known about Aristotle too. They teach Aristotle in Catholic high schools, his metaphysics. So they're, they're pre-programmed to blaspheme God. Now, who... Uh, did, did, does Aristotle serve God or Satan? Satan. He did not know God. The Scripture uh, says explicitly that the world, through its wisdom, through its philosophy, did not come to know God. So that there is the uh, the eternal decree of all things exhaustively. You can't avoid God being the author, the true author of sin. Uh, Calvin himself explained it this way. 
that God is not the author because God merely gives you the desire to do and the power to do the sin. He does not actually cause you to do it. So he determines it, and then he puts in you the wicked desire and the ability and the circumstances to carry out that sin. But God's not the author of it. Are you going to buy that? I don't. I don't. But that's what Calvin said. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what, that was his excuse. <clears throat> so, two here. Though God uh, knows whatsoever may or can come to pass under all supposed conditions, well, what's their justification for that? I do not think that's true. Uh, how can you know what isn't? Because you decreed all things. See, God's foreknowledge for Calvinists comes out of his eternal decree of all things. Now, now other people that, that say God looks down through the corridors of time, that's nonsense. Or, what? Where's the corridors of time to look down into? I mean, that's, that's, that's silly. You know, those things end up being self-contradictory. So, <clears throat> says the Lord who makes all these things known of from old. So that what is now Acts fifteen eighteen is talking about specific things that God had prophesied in the Old Testament, not talking about all things exhaustively. So again, Calvinism often goes too far. They take a truth and they push it to absolute limits. They universalize a particular. So God is saying a particular thing about things he made known from old in the from of old from in the prophets in the old testament and then they universalize it well let's let's go over to that uh acts 15 18 and that's what we're going to find there specific things not everything so it just shows that the westminster divines were corrupt they were uh they were not honest bible teachers <laughs> What does it actually say? It says, after this I will return, starting in verse 16, and I will rebuild the ta tabernacle of David. This is, let's see, this is Acts 15, is this is the church's decision. This is where the church convenes as a council, the, uh, the apostles and the elders and the congregation, about the issue of whether the Gentiles have to keep the law of Moses. That's the context here. And this is James, who God chose to bring forth his view. James was, followers from James were causing the problem. So God to use James to bring forth God's solution and God's judgment on this Um just shows how wise God is. Using the, the one that was perhaps responsible himself or his followers, often probably taking things that, uh, that James said a little bit too far, as followers often do. You know, like um, followers of Wesley took Wesley's strange aberrations and created the holiness movement. And so rather made a whole movement around his his worst doctrines. <sighs> it's the way followers are. James answered, uh, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared, that's Peter, has declared how God first visited the Gentiles to take them out, uh, take out of them, out from them, a people for his own name. Simon Peter went to Cornelius, the, the uh, the Roman centurion to the household of Cornelius, sent there by God, and God had to convince him to go there. If you remember, he had to give him a vision and repeated three times, what God has cleansed, do not regard as unclean. Referring to because the Jews regarded Gentiles as unclean. They do to this very day. That is what's the reason for the genocide in Gaza is that Jews, the Talmud, says that Non-Jews are subhuman. God doesn't want them to live. 
That's what they. That's what the the, the Talmud, the uh, Orthodox Judaism, are the descendants of the Pharisees. And from this, the words of the prophets agree, the words from, from old, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. What? Calls out the Gentiles to himself, too. So this is James looking to the prophets uh, to justify, to, 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 for guidance from God, is, is what do we do? Do the Gentiles have to keep the law? Known to God from eternity are all his works. Known to God from eternity, it's everything he is going to do. So does God do everything? Well, the Calvinists say yes. I say no. God doesn't make people sin. Sinners sin. Sinners choose to sin. We're responsible. We have a free will. Somewhat free. Christians sin. And, and we are not under obligation. We are not slaves of sin. Even people that are slaves of sin can will, can desire something other than what they're in bondage to. Alcoholics wish they weren't alcoholics once they realize they're in bondage. Drug addicts often wish to be free from the drug addiction. People that have sinners generally, you know, they recognize they're, they're slaves of it. They can't stop. Uh, they just give in. They can't resist. They try and fail. They're slaves. But that doesn't mean they, they want to be slaves necessarily. We have to recognize. So there is a will. They have a will con uh, contrary to their bondage. Uh, that's the, the human condition. As Paul talks about in one of the chapters, chapter 7 of Romans, where he says, uh, those things I, that I would do, I find myself not doing, and the very things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? That's the human condition. Sin dwells in our mortal body. But we're not... Well, uh, there's another issue. Calvinists say, say we're totally depraved. They go too far with that. We are slaves of sin in our natural state. We are born without the presence of God in us. That's the problem. But that doesn't mean we're, we're so depraved that we can't recognize good and evil and we can't desire to be better than we are. We're just unable to do it. We can't set ourselves free. We can't save ourselves. A sinner is illuminated by the, the Holy Spirit to his lost condition, and what happens as a result of that, the wages of sin is death. The, the broad way leads to destruction. Not wanting to end up in hell, we can cry out to God. Just like uh, a, a demon-possessed man in the Scripture would sometimes cry out to, to Christ. The, the, the demoniac of Gadarenes, Jesus comes over to the shore. They get out of the boat, and the, de, the demoniac runs toward him. Even though he's possessed by a whole legion of demons, he comes running to Christ. The demons were probably going, no, not there. Oh, we don't want to go see him. We know who that is. He's come to cast us out is why he was there. Why did Jesus make that, that stop that was not on his normal agenda? Let's put it that way. Because God wanted that man delivered. Perhaps he had cried out to God. Apparently wasn't even Jewish. God, deliver me. And God sent the deliverer.
Ask and you shall receive. So, known from eternity all his works. What do we know about that? That, for example, in the book of Re Revelation, we, we see uh, Jesus described as the Lamb crucified from the foundation of the world. Yes, God knew there would be a fall. Uh, that doesn't mean God ordained, decreed it, because I think the very fact that he created man in his own image meant that man had freedom. And God put that tree in the garden so man could choose either to obey or disobey. He also was free to eat of the tree of life before he sinned. He could have chosen that. There was no restrictions on that. But God said, don't eat of that tree. So if there's, if there's no opportunity for disobedience, there's no opportunity for obedience either. But man had to have a free choice to be the image of God. A robot's not the image of God, nor is a robot the image of man. No matter how sophisticated we make them, they're simply just a dead machine. That's not they, they don't have a spirit. They don't have a soul. They're not in the image of, of God. They might be in the image of fallen man, but God's purpose was to create, let us make man in our image. And that's what Christ is all about, restoring man to the image of God. All about re undoing the effects of the fall, undoing the work of the devil. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we are to write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from things strangled and from blood. Things that are particularly offensive to, to the Jews because their primary ministry was to the Jewish people. Paul was sent by God to the Gentiles primarily. So that the, they didn't want, especially these things like blood, um, things strangled and from blood, just the same thing, from meat that was not properly slaughtered. It still had the blood in it uh, because that was very offensive to the Jewish people. And we don't need any stumbling blocks. We, <laughs> no, no, no added problems like, look at those, those Jews that are following Christ. They're associating and eating the, 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 those, those dirty Gentiles over there. Yeah, I remember Peter had a little problem with that too because of fear from some followers of James. I think that, that occurred prior to this here. So that's the context there. So what, what are they saying that it means? The, uh, they're, they're saying that Acts 15, 8, 18 proves that God decreed all things and he knows all the future because he decreed all things. That's where the foreknowledge comes from in Calvinism because of the, it's, it's, it's logically consistent. They have a, cons, a logically rational explanation of God's comprehensive foreknowledge uh, because of their eternal, eternal decree. But this, the text doesn't prove it. There's things in the Bible that God doesn't know before it happens. Going back to Genesis, God brought the animals to Adam to, in order to see what Adam would name them, Adam would call them. And whatever Adam called them, that was her name. God didn't know because Adam had a free will. So if God knew what Adam would call them, they, his will wasn't really free. But the fact is that God does not know exhaustively and for certain what a person that has a or a being that has a free will will do creating a being with a free will means you don't know how could you know unless it's determined and if it's determined they don't have a free will a free will is not determined because if it is it's not free. 
again, uh, when God tests Abraham by having Abraham offer his son, the promised one, Isaac, as a sacrifice, God's, if, remember, if you remember that incident, uh, God's uh, angel stops him right at the moment he's about to kill him, kill Isaac, sacrifice him, and says, do not harm the child. Now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you would not withhold your only son from me. Which is also a statement about God himself, because he did not withhold his only begotten son from us. So that's why you have to you know, look at these references and see if it is really teaching what they claim it is, and look at the context. And if they're taking things out of context, you just need to discard them because they're not handling God's Word in a Christian way. Uh, that's a good testimony. Just see how they use God's Word. So it doesn't say that. It doesn't. Uh, it says here, I haven't finished, that, 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 that though he knows whatsoever may come, uh, may or can come to pass under all supposed conditions, how can you know what doesn't exist? So even under their system, if, if, if God did not decree what is not, how could he know what is not because he didn't decree it? All this stuff is self-contradictory. I know that probably gives you a headache, but it's like, I've been thinking about this stuff too long. If I can just rattle that off like that, there's something. I've, I've, I dived way too deep. It's a little scary sometimes. Yet he hath not decreed anything because he foresaw it as, a, as the future. He, it's refuting Arminianism. Arminius was a, a Calvinist professor in Holland that proposed our five amendments to their statement of faith, to their doctrine. Uh, called the, the, the He actually died before it came to judgment, but uh, the, the called the Remonstrance. So they had uh, five things they would like to see the, uh, the church, the Calvinist church in Holland, change. They thought it wasn't quite biblical. And one of them was the eternal decree. Uh, and what they because it it makes God into the author of all evil. Everybody recognizes that except the Calvinists. They they have so twisted their minds. They they somehow in the back of their mind they know they really do know that it's wrong. But they fight against it. They so struggle. They this is why they so uh, vigorously defend it because they really know it's wrong. They really know it's wrong. That they're trying to, they're trying to, uh, to, uh, to hold on to the faith, their faith, their ideas, uh, militantly because they really know they, they're not right. <clears throat> Yet he has. Uh, so they're they're opposing the doctrines uh, that came forth from the Remonstrance and what's called Arminianism, which is simply a modified Calvinism. It's it's a bad things taken out of Calvinism is all it is. Yet he and but they they just hate Arminian. Uh, they everybody that's not a Calvinist is called an Arminian, because Arminians earn their salvation. That's not true. That's not true. It's just Calvinists have to make everybody else guilty, turn everybody else into Pelagians, uh, in order to justify their own self. That's that's sin. That's sin, working that out. Uh, they're, they're utterly intolerant because they have to be because they're so fragile. They're, they're, they're so fragile. They, it's like the, with the Puritans coming to the wilderness. They could not endure living in the company of sinners, in the company of Christians that didn't believe, uh, have a high purity like them. Puritans. There's a reason they were called Puritans. They could not tolerate a church that wasn't the way they had to be in their own mind. And I suffer from that a little bit. 
I have to look to God, you know. Lord. But what I don't tolerate is the corruption of the gospel. It's like Calvinism. I can't tolerate Calvinism because it it blasphemes God. Now, they don't see that, or they don't want to see that, but it's still true. It, it, the God of Calvinism is not the God of the Bible. It's not the God that so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. It's just not. Um, so uh, what they're doing is they're saying not because God didn't foresee faith, God didn't dis foresee people looking into the future that they would come to him, but rather simply decreed. That's their point. A three, by the eternal decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, God, Calvin's idea of glory, the glory of God, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others are foreordained to everlasting death from before the foundation of the world. Individual. These angels, I won't bother with the proof text. You can find this stuff online. These angels and men, thus predestined and foreordained, are particularly, in other words, individually, and unchangeably designed, and their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. This all goes back to Aristotle. All of it goes back to a pagan philosopher and his ideas of perfection. It's present in Roman Catholicism. It's present in Lutheranism. But in Calvinism, it's the center. It's the absolute center. Calvinism, this is. See, Christ isn't the center of Calvinism. Not, not real Calvinism here. The eternal decree. Because the eternal decree determines whether a person is saved or, or lost. It has nothing to do with Christ. You could take Jesus Christ out of the Calvinist system. It wouldn't make any difference because the eternal decree is what causes people to, to be sent to hell or to go to heaven. That alone. God's absolute choice to create some people for salvation and other people for damnation. And the cross and Christ and God's love really aren't the issue at all. You could take that out, and it wouldn't change the system, which is what really damns it. Roman Catholicism is still Christian at its core. Calvinism at its core is not Christian at all. It's pagan. It's Aristotle at its core, not the love of God in Christ Jesus. In, in Roman Catholicism, that's been covered over by layers of tradition and obscured. But in Calvinism, Christ was never the center. Lutheranism, Christ is the center. Luther had these same ideas of predestination, but Christ was still the center. The gospel was the center. That's, those ideas were pushed aside. Many Calvinists, those ideas are pushed aside, like Charles Spurgeon, a famous Baptist preacher from the 19th century. Um, London uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, his sermons were printed in newspapers all over England. He never let his Calvinism, he held to this London 1689 confession, he never let Calvinism get in the way of preaching the gospel. He managed to, through inconsistency, to hold the Scripture higher than his Calvinism. And if a Calvinist does that, puts the Scripture above that, instead of putting the Calvinist, the Calvinist uh, confession above the Scripture, yeah, they can be a Christian. But when you hold to your confession above Scripture, and you believe what that says about God. No matter what, you're going to live with an internal contradiction. If you have hold to Calvinist beliefs 
and you hold to the scripture, you're going to have a mess inside because they're not reconcilable. You won't have peace over it. You'll be, which one are you going to hold to more? It's going to be difficult. You're better off simply disposing of the Calvinism because it doesn't come from God. But you get these ideas wired into your mind. It's not easy. You can't just flip a switch and erase that file, those files there. That's there, there. So you have to fill your mind with, with enough contrary scriptural proof and what the Bible really tells so you eventually overcome that false stuff. That's what Paul talks about the renewing of your mind. That's that. Program it with God's Word, God's promises, especially the New Testament. Uh, Calvinists don't make a proper distinction between the New Testament and the Old. Uh, so it has nothing to do with human actions and human decisions at all. In other words, it's all God's fault. How can God judge the world if he declared, declared everything uh, uh, exhaustively? How can you? How could God say, uh, you're going to hell because of what you did, and what's, but you decreed it? What's God going to say? Yeah, but I decreed you to go to hell, so go to hell. Really? Isn't that rather arbitrary? <laughs> That's like justice in America nowadays, what they're doing to Trump. I mean, it has nothing to do with justice. I'm not a fan of Trump, by the way. I don't, don't think I support Trump. I just look at what the Democrats are doing. These people are utterly lawless. I don't support Biden. It's like, I think, you know, the devil gives us two choices in the United States for elections, usually. Uh I don't find either choice acceptable. So there was a movie. What was it? Uh, well, it was a sci-fi movie. And at the end of the movie, it's, there's a line in there, the only way to win is to not play the game. So I think for Christians, often in this world, the only way to win is to not play the devil's game. Because if the devil plays, he stacks the deck. That's what he does in politics. He, he gives us the choices. The deck is stacked. No matter who wins, they're his guy or gal. We need to understand how it works. But we're programmed from our youth up to believe stuff <laughs> We have to be have our minds renewed through the scriptures. Let God rewire us. And it takes time. It takes time to think biblically. It does take I'm only beginning to come into it. So uh section six here he says well, let's five. Those of mankind uh, that are predestined unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, his eternal decree again, and the and the, the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will. If it's a secret counsel, how do you know what it is, Calvinists? Hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of his mere free grace and love. So arbitrarily choosing people is Calvin's idea of the gospel. It is. And the five points, Calvinists will talk about the five points of Calvinism, TULIP, as being the gospel, God's arbitrary choice of some people for salvation. And it is arbitrary. Absolutely, it has to be arbitrary, according to them. That is the gospel. Well, not if you're not chosen, it's not. It's not good news at all. It's God has chosen you for damnation, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Is that the gospel? No, it's not. Not at all. I don't see John 3.16 there anywhere. 
Why not? Because it doesn't fit their system. Out of his mere free grace and love. It's not out of grace and love at all. Calvinism has nothing to do with grace and love. It's just an arbitrary choice. Without any foresight of faith or good works or perver perseverance in them. Uh, well, that's true. We come to Christ, it's merely because we call upon him to be saved. It's God, God's grace is whosoever will. It's not because of our works or, you know, in, it's, or foresight of faith or anything like that. Of course not. God, the gospel is proclaimed if you believe it and call upon God to save you, he saves you. That's God's grace. That's God's decree that salvation shall be by grace through faith in Christ. That's what he decreed from before the foundation of the world. See if that doesn't fit the text. Or anything in the creature as conditions or causes moving him uh, there to. Um, but all to the pr uh, praise of his glorious grace. See, grace to them is simply a God's arbitrary choice based on nothing except God's arbitrary choice. I think that one will be saved. I think that one's going to be damned. Is that really? How, how are human beings even human beings in this system? We're not. We're not morally accountable creatures. We're, you know, we're, not, we're not fallen. We are simply damned because of not of sin. See, damnation isn't based on our sinfulness either. It's based on God's arbitrary choice. <sighs> So then it goes into sex. Sex goes into the uh, the elect. Uh, the, the, when the scripture uses the term elect, if you search it, you'll find that elect only refers to those who are believers. They're elect because they have believed. They're not elect because of an eternal decree from before time. That's not what you just look on the word elect and see what's referred to or chosen. He compares the stuff with the Scripture. Verse 7, those that don't believe the rest of mankind, God was pleased, 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 according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will. Well, how do you know he was pleased if his, un if his counsel of his own will is unsearchable? This is called BS. Whereby he, this is, this is blasphemy against God. He extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth. pleaseth. If you go to one of their favorite pr proof texts, where Paul's talking about this in Romans chapter 9. Then he goes on to Romans chapter 10 and says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In chapter 9, he brings up the issue of, of the two sons of um, uh, Isaac. You have Jacob and you have Ishmael, or not Ishmael, I, uh, Esau. Esau. And the scripture says God hated Esau, but he loved Jacob. And if you go, go to the book of Hebrews, you'll find out why God hated Esau, because Esau despised his birthright. Therefore, God hated him. But they, the Calvinists, was, well, God chose to hate Esau before he was even born. And they bring up the issue that God ch said the younger or the older shall serve the younger, which God did decree. And Paul makes that point that it might be of God's choice. But what did God choose? That's what is the title in entire context 
that Paul is talking about and arguing for, that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ and not of works. Esau was, God chose contrary to tradition to bless the younger rather than the older because it was God's choice to do that. That wasn't damnation. The reason God hated Esau was because Esau despised God. Search, search the scriptures. These people are not really knowledgeable about the Bible either. Again, the verse seven or paragraph seven goes on. He, he uh, as he pleads this to withhold or extend mercy for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures, to pass by and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin that he decreed. For the praise of his glorious justice. How can God be just if he decrees people to sin? Who is the one that's unjust? God is. It blasphemes God. Satan got these people, so messed them up in their theology that they continuously... Uh, especially on the internet, promote blaspheming God, blaming God for all the evil in this world. I don't think they know what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. Uh, that That's ridiculous. So let's take a look here. Let's take a look here. Okay, first of all, let's go to John 3.16. They always tried to dismantle this verse, too. Uh, the favorite verse of, of Bible believers everywhere. Calvinists aren't Bible believers. That's, that's a problem. So John 3.16 says what? We know what it says. We know it's what it says. For God so loved the world. He loved the world, the cosmos. So actually, salvation is undoing not only man's sinfulness, but also undoing the chaos in creation that man's fall unleashed. Uh, and man, when, when Christ returns and we are conformed to his image, uh, Paul talks about creation itself groaning, waiting eagerly for the unveiling of the sons of God. Because in that, they, the creation itself will be uh, set free from its bondage to corruption. It's waiting. Creation, all creation, is waiting for the return of Christ and the revelation of Christ and the children of God. Remember, man was supposed to have dominion over the earth. The earth is suffering chaos and damage from sin. And when and Christ will restore all things, including creation, to be the way it was originally created to be. Through him and his brothers and sisters, the children of God, have a power over creation, not subject to the laws of entropy, the laws, the second, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, which causes all says all things run down. They don't have to in Christ. Climate change won't be an issue unless God desires the climate to change. All things will be brought under the dominion of Christ. We will rule and reign with him for a thousand years in this created order. Calvinists generally don't believe that either. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Christ is called the Son of his love. Remember that? That whoever believes in him, all those who are believing in him, 
That is not a, a single. This is an on. This is a. In the Greek here, this is a. Greek is very adept at, at making statements about, things that are in a continuing state. So this is a continuing state of belief. In other words, people whose lives are characterized by faith in Christ. It's not simply a one-time event. It's not simply an on and off thing. But in general, they are in a state of believing. That doesn't mean they're a state of perfection, but they're, yes, I'm a believer in Christ. We use the word a believer. Not to, I, I once believed. That's not what it means. It means you are a continuing in faith in Christ. That they he should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. God so loved sinners. Christ was sent into the world to save sinners because God loves his creation, his cosmos. He loves humanity. The reason he sent his son into the world was to save sinners, as Paul says. Calvinists don't believe that God loves. They don't understand love. They're, or, or Calvin didn't, and their system doesn't. Let me not say Calvinists. Calvinism does not understand love. Calvinism does not know God. Calvinism rejects John 3.16. They reject that God loved the entire world, that God sent his son for the entire world. Is there a condition for eternal life? Yes, faith alone is the condition. Faith in Christ is the condition. Salvation has a condition, that you believe God, that you believe in the one he sent. That's all that's necessary. Let's go look at another. See, Calvinists fight against the very word of God. They don't like it. They fight against their system. It's like kryptonite to them. Certain passages. 1 Timothy 2.4 is one of these passages. Actually, it's 1 Timothy uh, 2, four through 6. They hate it. They spent a lot of time trying to deconstruct this passage. And Paul says here, who desires all men to be saved, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, Calvinists will say, well, it doesn't mean all men. It means all kinds of men. Well, the fact is, I'm, I'm not going to take you into the Greek, but the fact is that the Greek here actually says all men. It doesn't say all kinds of men. That's a different form. This is what set me free from Calvinism, uh, that the Holy Spirit, there was a lexicon open on the right side of the page, and I believe it was, look, yeah, and uh, I looked at this, and like the Holy Spirit just took my eye and, Geek! see that? It's like, my, my eye caught this thing, and like, what? What? I've been lied to. I've been lied to. I had bought into that because some of these people have actually taught Greek, and I just believed them. <laughs> Don't trust human beings. Check it out. Check it out. And I saw that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. They've been telling me that it means all kinds of people. It doesn't mean all people. It doesn't mean all men. It means all kinds of men. Of course, in our language-confused age now, you have to realize that when it says men, anthropoi, that means human beings. There's another word for a male, an heir, but this is anthropoi. It means all human beings in general. Um, and that's it would be in a masculine context, just like in Spanish. All you language Nazis out there. <sighs> Uh, that have to uh, project your own problems on everything. It's like people that project racism on everything they see. 
You know, you look in the grocery store and there's chocolate and vanilla. Oh, racist ice cream. Because their minds are programmed. Again, a neural network. You got to be careful with your neural network. If you get programmed in university to see like racism everywhere or Marx's class struggle everywhere, you'll see it everywhere. That's what's wrong with these kids. They go to university and their heads are messed up. You're better off not going to that stuff. Go out and get a real job working with your hands. Become a welder, plumber. Um, you can't afford to be a farmer, but do something useful. Something that actually does something. Something that you don't have to pollute your mind with. You'll be happier. And your brain will work better. Because it won't have all that garbage in there. Be careful what you put in your head. It will haunt you. It can kill you. So he says here, Paul writes, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That means all men. It doesn't mean all kinds of men. Don't believe the lie. It truly means all men. I could show it to you, but it would take extra time. And it's in the Greek. <laughs> it's sim But it's there. You, you can, uh, if somebody wants to know, I can tell them. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Yes, only one way, and that's Christ. As he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. Universal atonement. Yeah, it says all. It means all. If you try to make it mean anything else, you are throwing out what the original language says. All there means all, not all kinds. That's a different form. All. To be testified in the new time. In other words, that, that his, uh, g Christ was given at a particular time to complete his work, especially his work on the cross, of which I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle. So, they have to de deconstruct the Scripture in order to keep their doctrine intact. That tells you that they do not believe in Sola Scriptura. They do not believe in the testimony of Scripture. Again, they've been programmed for this. They've been programmed, and they will see the what their brain has been taught to see. They're looking for their brain is saying, see Calvinism in the Scripture. They don't know what's happening, but that's happening behind the scenes. And that's why it's so important that you f fill your mind with what the Scripture actually says, with Scripture itself. And that's pretty easy nowadays. That I mean, we can listen to, uh, listen to the Scripture on recordings. We, we waste so much time listening to garbage you know, put it on your phone or you know, on a, a stick, a USB stick or CD or whatever in your car. So when you're driving down the road, just have the scripture playing. I recommend uh, Alexander Scorby's narrations. It's King James, but it's a good thing to learn the King James too. It is the standard English translation. And it's not going to be changed and there's no copyright on it. If you're going to memorize something, memorize that. Nobody's going to change it. Uh, <clears throat> they might try to dispose of it, but it's pretty hard. <laughs> But so let, let it fill your mind. Renew your mind. Let your, you don't have to be paying attention all the time. Just let that be playing in the background, and it will get into your mind. Your brain will wire your neural networks to think biblically and hold a sound theology, not this kind of garbage. Anything... Uh, um, Roman Catholicism, their, their doctrine, well, they have this, this stuff in the doctrine of God, too, but it's not promoted, uh, <clears throat> these kind of, some of these ideas. Because Roman Catholicism, there's been so many different things in Roman Catholicism, it's hard to generalize. There's different movements and everything else, different teachers. Augustinianism was one thing. You had others. There's still all these things there. Uh, you go back to the scriptures. That's what everybody holds in common. 
if you if you think there should be one church with one faith, go back to the scriptures. Fill your mind with the scriptures. Fill your mind with the New Testament, the testimony of the apostles. You don't need to worry about, don't fill your, your head with Moses. Moses kills. The law kills. It is the gospel. It is Christ who gives life. These theonomists, these Calvinists don't understand it. They want to go back to the law all the time. Uh, we, we, want, we need to look at Jesus and see what Jesus is like. Jesus would, would never, see, the Puritans would never tolerate Jesus because Jesus would eat with prostitutes and tax collectors. If we want to follow in his steps, we have to be willing to be able, we have to be able to do that also. Jesus was not troubled by that, even though he's God. So if your God is different than Jesus, it's not the God of the Bible. Jesus said to Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus, the one who would eat with tax collectors and prostitutes. Can you imagine the Puritans doing that? No. No, they wouldn't. They would not do that. They're too pure to do that. They're like the Pharisees. Puritans are like the Pharisees in many ways. In fact, they put their own traditions above the Word of God. So that's why I hate Calvinism, because it blasphemes God and puts that blasphemy in the minds of everyone that buys into this thing this system of man's tradition called Calvinism. And it will harden your heart. You'll start becoming like the God of Calvin rather than like Jesus Christ. I noticed that was happening to me. I think God allowed this to happen to me in order that I might tell you don't go there. <laughs> and what's wrong with it? That's what's wrong with it. I, I never held it before, but I think he led me through the waters of Calvin uh, and kept me safe and brought me up the other side that I might speak to some people out there who have been deceived by this perhaps open their eyes to Christ. So if you think your heart is getting a little hard, you need to get back to Christ and God, the God who loves the entire world, who gave his Son that all men might be saved. So we don't have to answer the question why some are saved and some aren't, even though the Bible really does answer it. Logic cannot reveal God because God is much greater than logic. Things like love are not subject to logical constructs. God cannot be reduced to logical statements. Logic is of a man. It is man's ideas, not God's. Philosophy comes from man, not from God. If you want to know what God thinks, you have to look in the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, because that's where God is clearly revealed. God is revealed clearly in Jesus Christ. He is the perfect image of God. He is God himself. Moses isn't God. Christ is God. Look to him, and you will see God Almighty.